Hello everyone, I want to talk today about orthophotos, which are a tool which allows you to measure directly in images. So if you typically take an image with your camera, you can't easily measure distances in an image, like whatever, five pixels correspond to a centimeter in the real world. That's something that you cannot do based on the process, how the camera transforms the points from the 3D world into the image plane. So three pixels measured at some position in the image, object number one, compared to another object of the same size located somewhere else in the image will not be three pixels as well. It will have a different size. And that's a problem of measuring directly with images. In the lecture today, we will look into autophotos, which are a special form of images. And this special form of images allows you to perform these types of measurements. And we will discuss how we can actually obtain those images. There is a measurement process, how we can get those types of images, at least in an approximative way, in maybe four constraint setups. Um, but the things we're generally interested in is how can we turn actual photos that we have with a standard camera and standard setup into autophotos so that we then can perform measurements in those images, at least within the X, Y plane of the image. So we can't still measure the Z direction, obviously, um, but with respect to the X and Y orientation. So why is that relevant? Why should we care about this? A prominent example that you may see is an aerial image of a city like here uh, from Bonn and you want to be able to take measure distances in those images. So, so for example that this distance over here, so the park in front of the um, Poppelsdorf castle is the same thing as the distance between two blocks here where we are located in our building at the Nussallee. Um, so if you want to say this distance and this distance are the same, so I know it's the same distance in the real world, that's obvious, obviously something which is useful. You also need this in order to overlay metric information, like here the street information, over the aerial image so that they actually end up at being at the same location. Because otherwise, um, if you have the precise metric um, location or configuration of the road network, how could you overlay it with an image where the proportions are out of place? That would not work. So the, the thing we are looking into is how can we actually change an image so it has these properties that we can overlay those images. And these are images or must be images which have a central form of projection that we actually need. And we can quite nicely illustrate that. So what we have in reality, and we have a perspective camera, we have a perspective projection. So if the camera is actually sitting here and is observing the scene down here, let's say from a UAV for example, then all the rays will pass through the projection center of the camera then onto the chip and generate rays which are moving in the real world and this will generate an image for example which looks like this. So you can see that those rays are not parallel but they are, have been shooted out at different angles into the world. As a result of this, as you're flying here with a UAV, you will for example see the white wall of that building over here that is something you would not want in a top-down view where the metric distances are correct because if you look from top down you shouldn't be able to see those walls over here. Or also this pole will actually be bent to the side. And this is a result of the perspective um, projection that the cameras do. What we would like to have is a so-called orthogonal parallel projection. So in this case the image plane over here is, is a huge image plane, basically as large as the, as the world we're looking into, maybe just scaled down later on. And all the rays from the pixel onto the world should be parallel. And we have a right angle, how they leave the image plane and cut through the world. So an, an image which looks like this from top, which would be the so-called orthophoto, the thing we're interested in, basically means that a distance here in an image and the distance on the ground are identical, of course only up to a scale factor because your image is to be not as large as the world, but up to a scale factor, um, this is identical. So that you know whatever, three pixels in an image correspond to whatever, one meter fifty in the real world, independently if it's taken here, here, or here. And this is what we want to have from this orthophoto. Of course we have to take certain things into account like 
kind of how far are those objects away, what's the height of those objects, it's also something that we need to consider. But in the end, we want to have this type of images so that we can actually perform measurements and saying, whatever, this tree is as large as that house. This is something that we can do with those autophotos. And in this lecture, we will basically discuss how we can start from a regular camera image recorded with a perspective uh, projection and turn it into an autophoto so that we then can perform measurements with these images. This requires not only image information, that also requires knowledge about the 3D structure of the world, um, but that's something that we will investigate throughout this lecture. Here is an example, um, for example, from Cologne, provided by the uh, Bezirksregierung Köln, um, where you can see how a true autophoto looks like. So this is just kind of the, the photo that you have here of that tower in Cologne, and what you see down here, this would be the corrected top-down autophoto over here, where you can see how this correction has been taking place, that you don't see the sides of this tower anymore, and you have, uh, you can actually perform measurements in this image, which you couldn't do in this image over here. And again, this allows you then to overlay um, metric information with image information. So for example, you recorded a GPS track with your mobile phone or any other device, a GPS tracker, so the positions of your, of your device in the world, and you were driving over roads. If you would just take, um, overlay that with a with an regular, regular aerial image which has not been corrected, and you would drive around here through the city block, you can actually see that in some areas here, you get a very good overlay of the road and your GPS track here shown in red, but in other locations, like down here, you see a big deviation uh, between the actual image, the aerial image, and, the, um, and your GPS track, also over here. And this is not a result of a systematic mistake of your GPS tracker. The result is here that your photo hasn't been corrected. If you correct your photo and turn your photo into an autophoto, then you would get a result which looks like this. So you can see here how the uh, trajectory actually nicely aligns with the roads. And so the question is, how can we start from here? and how we can actually end up here. And that's what this lecture here is about today. So the autophoto is an image of the surface of an object that is taken in orthogonal parallel projection. And that means that all the rays are parallel and not have an angle with each other as it would be in the um, perspective projection and that you have your image plane which, which sits orthogonal to that. And if you think what kind of measurement setup would, be, would actually generate autophotos or something close to autophotos. This is actually the case if you, if you walk away from your object. Let's say I'm taking my camera and take an object of the scene here. And the further I walk away, kind of keeping the zoom or the, the crop in the same way, the closer or the smaller the angles between the individual rays get. And if I'm infinitively far away, then they are parallel. The problem is I typically cannot walk infinitely far away, so I cannot obtain a perfect autophoto. Um, but if I have pictures of an object where I'm very far away, I'm actually close to that setup. And this is the case, for example, with satellite images. Satellites are actually pretty far away from the Earth, and so all the rays are more or less parallel. So we can see satellite imagery as a good approximation of an autophoto. But as we typically don't have our own satellite uh, somewhere up in space which takes pictures of um, the objects we're interested in, uh, we may want to generate those images on our own. And this is what this lecture is about, how we can generate those autophotos synthetically. That's also how it is done typically, like those images that I've shown in the beginning from Cologne, uh, those which have been synthetically corrected, taking into account where the, the, the camera image has been taken from and exploiting knowledge about the 3D world. So in order to perform this correction, we need to have information about the 3D structure. So where was the camera and what's the uh, 3D information about that scene. Okay, how does it work? Inputs and outputs. The input, what we need, is an image of the surface that we actually want to look into. So let's say um, the, the surface of a park um, that we see on the ground. Um, and what we need in order to actually perform this correction, we need to know where this image has been taken and we need to know the parameters of our camera. Probably something which doesn't surprise you, that you need to know from where an image has been taken and what the intrinsics of your camera are. So your interior and exterior orientation or intrinsics and extrinsics of that image. And what we also need to know is additional information. We need to have 3D information about the scene. 
So we need to know how far every point that we are seeing is actually away from whatever, some ground plane, some reference ground plane. So we need to have 3D information about the scene. And if we have that, if we have this information, <clears throat> then we can turn this into an orthophoto, so an image with taken under uh, orthogonal and um, parallel projection. And this has the properties that we can actually obtain that. Uh, then we can perform our measurements in that image. And the question is, how do we obtain that type of image? Um, so how do we do this in practice? How do we get that input information that we need? There are different ways on how to estimate where the camera is and what the 3D information looks like. Um, so just to be very, make a very simple setup, so assume you take your camera and you calibrate your camera, uh, whatever, using Zhang's method, for example, as a pre-step. So you only have um, calibrated images and you can ignore the interior information about that. That's the first thing you would do. And the second thing is you need to know where the camera actually looks to. Let's say you equip your, an aerial vehicle, a UAV, with a GPS sensor and um, an IMU, so you get an idea where the platform is at every point in time, where it is looking to, so you know the extrinsics of your camera. But then you need to know information about the 3D structure of the world and how do we actually get that. So the 3D information about the world is the thing which is probably the most difficult to obtain. Um, what you can do is you can start with a so-called DTM, a digital terrain model, which is basically an elevation model of the surrounding surfaces, which is typically provided at a coarse resolution. So you know the height of every point on the world. The problem with these, those digital terrain models is typically that objects who are artificially placed there, such as buildings or high buildings, skyscrapers, are not correctly in this digital terrain models because it only describes the terrain itself. So if you have objects who are standing out from your terrain, they will have an incorrect 3D information. And as we will see later on, this will actually lead to errors in your autophoto. A better thing to obtain is a digital surface model. And the digital surface model actually describes the whole surface. So it describes also the skyscrapers standing out or trees which are there in the environment. So what we want to have is actually want to have a digital surface model, so a model which tells me about the 3D structure of that. How do we obtain this? One thing is with airborne laser scanning, so we're taking laser scanner and fly with um, a UAV, for example, over, um, over the scene and then get 3D information. Or alternatively, we do a 3D reconstruction directly from this image information, for example, using bundle adjustment, as we have discussed it here previously, um, and then get a 3D model of the surface, then we also know where the camera is or where the, where the UAV was, for example, with respect to the information that we have collected. So we have the interior and exterior orientation as well as the um, 3D model computed jointly so that this is to be a very good starting point for computing our autophoto. So the results of doing a 3D reconstruction, a dense 3D reconstruction of the environment using a bundle adjustment based uh, optimization approach before and is typically the way to go. So we had an example that we have shown also in the lecture and bundle adjustment. We have this UAV flying over the ground, taking images, and the bundle adjustment solution actually outputs this point cloud. And this point cloud is a 3D location of every point where now the X, Y, and Z coordinate, so I can directly turn this into a digital surface model. So I have for every point, I know the height of that point, the 3D information about every point in that world. Maybe this takes into account some interpolation in here because the points are not infinite, infinitely densely sampled and depending on the 3D structure and texture of the objects down there, you may need to interpolate between some points, but then you basically get for every point the height information so that you could then render an autophoto. And generating these types of autophotos, so what you see here, is what we are looking into. So this means we can obtain this digital surface model just based on the image information that we have um, through a bundle adjustment based procedure. And again, it's important to note what the difference between a digital terrain model and a digital surface model is. The digital terrain model would be the, just the, the raw terrain shown here in black and the digital surface model has also the artificial objects in there, such as houses or trees, there's a DSM, and you want to have this DSM in order to build uh, a correct orthophoto, um, and so what we assume we can actually compute it on our own 
for example, using the bundle adjustment approach so that we do not necessarily need to rely on external DSMs provided uh, by some other provider. We can actually compute that on our own using the bundle adjustment approach. Okay, so what do we have? <clears throat> we know where our camera images has been taken. We know the three surface of the, of the world we want to picture. So how to get our autophoto. Okay, in the remaining part of this lecture, we will use this simplified view or drawing that will show up a few times. So what, what do we have? Here we have kind of the surface, let's say some hilly surface, and we want to actually turn images of this surface into an autophoto. So we have a UAV, for example, flying around, and this is um, the camera image, and here we have the ray that this point from the camera image, uh, from the 3D world, is projected to this point in our camera image. And we can perform this mapping because we know how to map a 3D point from the world into our camera image with this small x equals P capital X um, equation and how a 3D point is mapped with a projection matrix onto a camera image. Okay? So how do we get our autophoto? We can see our autophoto as lying underneath that surface. So let's define this as our autophoto being for now, as large as the surface we want to picture in. We are basically laying out a grid under that surface we want to picture. Just for, for our mental illustration in here. So this will be our autophoto. Later on, I may scale this autophoto down so it gets smaller. And then I know that whatever one pixel corresponds to 10 meters in the world or something like this. Um, but for now, assume this autophoto has the same size than the world we actually want to picture. And then we need to compute, we need to fill this autophoto and compute the intensity value of that autophoto from the image that I have up here. And how can we do this? Okay, what we are doing, we are basically taking points in this autophoto. So these are basically pixel locations in my autophoto. And say, okay, which color information, which intensity information should this pixel actually get? Okay, so what we can do is we can actually move up here just if this is kind of x and x and y direction and this is z direction, x, y, z, then we just move upwards in this x direction until we intersect with the surface which lies on top of my kind of virtual autophoto plane. Okay, so I actually have that point over here. For this point, I know it's x, y, and z location. x, y comes directly from the autophoto where this pixel was. It's an artificial point that I'm creating. And then going up, moving up on my, uh, on my surface, on my digital surface model, and through the intersection of this ray with the surface model, I actually get the height of this point, so it's z-coordinate. So as a result of this, I know the x, y, z-coordinate of that point over here. If I know the x, y, z-coordinate of that point over here, I can actually project it into my image and then obtain the intensity value over there. So let's see how that looks like. So this is my point x, o in the point x, inside my autophoto. Based on this point XO, I can actually obtain the XYZ location of this point over here. So the 3D point with an X, Y, and Z location. Again, XY stems from the autophoto point and Z stems from the digital surface model. And then I'm executing the equation XK equals PX, so this is in the camera coordinate system. Then this point will be mapped over here and I know where this point is in the world. If I know where this point is in the world, I can actually take the intensity value from that image. So I know where this real world point is mapped into the image and I take the intensity value and basically copy it down here. So the intensity value of this point in the autophoto is basically the intensity value of this point I have here in my image. And that's illustrated how the overall process works. So I need to create my autophoto plane underneath my surface. I compute for every pixel point in this autophoto where is this point intersecting with the surface that I want to picture, which gives me a 3D point. The 3D point is then mapped with the equation x equals px into the camera image, and the intensity value of that pixel is taken and copied into the autophoto. That's basically, in a simplified form, the overall approach that we are looking into. So the idea is project um, uh, the, an image from the image to the surface model, 
and then project the textured surface model onto the xy plane. So this would be the other way around. I take this point, look here, and project it down. But mathematically, I have to take it the other way around um, because I go from 3D to 2D and can't go from 2D to 3D. So as a simplified process, for every point or each point in the autophoto plane, we determine the surface point, we map the surface point into my camera image, and we copy over the intensity value. What however happens is that, well, what I cannot guarantee that I'm selecting those points down here in a precise, the, 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 the pixel raster that I'm generating for my autophoto corresponds to points I actually have on my surface and that the point which is then projected into the camera image actually aligns with the pixel raster of the image itself. So it looks like I have to do some interpolations in here. So first, who tells me that this pixel raster directly corresponds to the raster that I have in here? And if this point is projected into the image, who tells me that this directly ends up in the middle and the center of a pixel? Maybe it's just somewhere between two pixels. So which pixel value should I actually be taking? And so I need to perform some corrections for computing the corresponding intensity value due to this process. And this is something that we actually have to do. So the first thing we need to do, which surface point should we actually be taken? And again here, we have to perform an interpolation of the surface point based on the neighboring points, because typically I do not will I'm exactly in a 3D point. I will basically need to look to neighboring points and interpolate between those neighboring points. Or maybe I already computed a surface model based on a triangle mesh, for example, then I could intersect the triangle mesh with my um, with, with, the, with the line, the straight line, that goes out, out of the autophoto through the surface model. But even if I, have, if I have this point and have a kind of smooth surface model over here and I project this point into the image, it is very unlikely that I actually will end up in the middle of a pixel. And typically I'm somewhere inside a pixel. So I may need to take the neighboring pixels into account in order to interpolate the color value and obtain the right color value to set the correct one. And there are different ways how I can do this. I can do this based on an interpolation of my neighboring points. So um, what we need to do, for, and we need to do this for the DSM, and we need to do this for the, um, for the pixel information itself. So it's the same process that we are running here. So if these are the points that you know you're having, and you want to for some point over here, estimate the actual location. This is done by interpolating through your neighboring points. And you can do this, for example, by bilinear interpolation, something that we have discussed before in this course, by taking kind of how far is this point away from, from this point over here, from this point over here, from this point over here, and from this point over here, in order to determine a weighted sum of those neighboring points and compute either the height information or the, um, the information about the, uh, the color value if I'm then in an image. So for example, with a bilinear interpolation or uh, a bicubic interpolation, I would typically obtain that point. So the first thing is I need to obtain the correct height information by sampling um, my DSM in a different way by interpolating the locations that I'm actually interested in when computing my autophoto. Okay, and then what I need to do also in, an Im in the image, if, if I am in an image point, let's say this is the point which I want to compute and these are the center locations of the neighboring pixels, then I need to interpolate those neighboring points and in order to set the pixel value for my autophoto. And again, this is something that I, um, that I need to do if I, I can't or I can, of course, assign just kind of the closest pixel. So I'm saying I'm falling to this pixel, I take this pixel value. This is what we would call a nearest neighbor interpolation. But we have seen that this is a suboptimal interpolation. And bilinear interpolation is better and bicubic interpolation is even better. And um, typically often we don't do this just kind of for one single channel. We don't have just one single intensity value. We actually have three or even more intensity values the RGB value or maybe even some other channels which are involved in this. And in this case, I would need to do this interpretation for the different channels itself and then compute an interpolated intensity value for the red, green, and blue channel, for example, over here. What we in practice 
do we actually perform not uh, a bilinear interpolation, we perform a bicubic interpolation because this gives even better results. And the bicubic interpolation, also something that we've discussed, we just don't take the four neighbors into account, but we take, take the 16 neighbors into account, uh, neighboring points, and um, are not fitting um, a, a linear function between uh, the four neighboring points, but a cubic function in both directions, and this way come up with um, 16 coefficients, so if this is the position we want to interpolate, we basically take one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So always two point two to the left and two to the right in both directions into account. So we have a four by four neighborhood, 16 points that we need to um, take into account. This will lead to um, a different number of coefficients that need to be taken into account, exactly 16 coefficients, the Cij, which we can compute with um, the, um, uh, bicubic interpolation in order to come up with our values and are then able, oh, sorry, and are then able to perform this interpolation from one image to the other image. What can happen if I perform interpolation and interpolate those points in between? Um, the problem is that this downsampling may lead to so-called aliasing effects. So consider that your original image is this black white striped structure and you're now downsampling the points at those locations which are shown here in red and they are slightly off through the raster um, of the original image, something which can easily happen. So okay, I say, what is this point? Oh, this point is a black point, so put black in here. This point, oh, black, put black in here. This one also black, put black in here. Also black, put black in here. Still black, put black in here. Oh, white, this gets white. White, 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 black. Black, 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 white, white. And you see you get a new pattern which looks like this, which is clearly different to this pattern. So those two patterns are different. And these are aliasing issues that you have if you resample your image. And as we have seen in the Photogrammetry 1 course, um, if you perform this um, just by simply downsampling, we, can, we get those aliasing effects. So for example, we have this example of the brick wall. We just scale down the image by 60%. Uh, we get this aliasing patterns in here. We, however, can get rid of this effect by performing additional smoothing. So by performing a smoothing kernel over the image before I downsample that image. And that's also something that I may need to do here, perform a smoothing operation or taking multiple points into account to get the, um, the proper intensity values extracted and do not suffer from this aliasing effects. So this is something that is important that I need to do in order to get a high quality image out in the end. Something to keep in mind. So assuming now we have done all that perfectly. So we performed the proper interpolation, did the best we could do, everything looks great. Still, we can have errors in our autophotos and it's important to understand what errors can actually occur and um, what the effect of those errors is. So which um, quantities lead to which types of errors or which types of observations or suboptimal observations lead to errors. The first and most problematic one are inaccurate digital surface models. So either um, you, you, let's say, purchase a digital surface model and the digital surface model is a year old and new building has been built in a certain area or a building has been taken down, then of course your information will be incorrect and your digital surface model is not the right one. Or you compute it on your own, but your bundle adjustment approach um, has failed, or maybe bundle adjustment did the right job, but the estimation of your data association, your correspondences, were not correct all the time, and therefore you get wrong 3D information about the scene. So you will have inaccuracy, inaccuracies in your digital surface model, and this will lead to mistakes in your image. So height errors in your digital surface model, let's say a wrong Z coordinate they obtained for a point will be mapped into a planimetric errors in our autophoto. That means a shift of the object in the XY plane. So by having a wrong height estimate of the point in the 3D world will actually lead to a shift in the X or Y direction in my autophoto and this way to a wrong information because then I can't measure in my photo anymore. And uh, the displacement also depends with respect to the nadir direction of the camera. So depending on where those objects has been pictured in your image, you will make different 
magnitudes of mistakes. And it's important to kind of take that into account and see how you need to actually hold your camera with respect to your underlying surface in order to get the best possible result out of here. And the second problem that can happen are actually occlusions. If you have tall objects and you are flying with your camera, it may simply be the case that the object occludes what's behind that object. And you simply don't have an intensity information, a pixel information in your recorded image data that shows a part of the surface that you actually want to map. Just because there has another object been in between obstructing your field of view. And if you have occlusions, that means you have basically black spots in your image. And that's something which is also something that you don't want to have. So we'll now go through the problem of inaccurate DSMs and occlusions and see what kind of errors we get in our autophotos in order to understand them and maybe be able to compensate for them or at least know about the magnitude that this error can have. So let's start with the inaccurate DSM. Again, this can happen by um, using, if you use off-the-shelf terrain models, so um, this is not that problematic anymore because today a lot of those um, digital surface models are created with uh, airborne laser scanning or you can even use your own bundle adjustment approach in order to take into or to make sure that the point in time when the 3D model was created is identical to the point in time when you took your images in order to create your autophotos. So the situation has substantially improved and we actually get high quality autophotos out of that. But still, if it is not the case, if you only used a surface model, let's say, where those two buildings are not in there, then this is a triangular building and this is a, a rectangular building. The correct location of that building would actually be here, this is the, where the roof should be, so this one over here, and it's shifted away in the xy direction. This is the, this is the effect that a, a different altitude value or different height value will lead to a planimetric error in your autophoto. And you can illustrate this here. So what happens is, let's say you do not know about this new building which has been built over here. So, um, and you're, you want to estimate the, the pixel intensity value of this point here, of this lower black point. So you go up, you intersect it with your surface, and then take this point and project it into the pixel location. So that's what you think you have done. Took the intensity value that corresponds to this point over here. In reality, however, this building was there, and actually this point over here was projected into this pixel location because it's occluding the other point over here. Um, and the other point cannot be chosen because there's a new building, there's a mistake in the, in the height values. So this point over here will be mapped, so you will copy the wrong intensity value. So you will actually copy the intensity value, which should be over here, and move it to this location. So it means you're changing the xy location of that point just because you have a wrong altitude estimate or wrong height estimate. And this is the effect that is generated by having a wrong, a wrong height, uh, that value, height value and leading to a planimetric error in your 3D model. So let's look into the vertical errors that lead to this radial displacement. So for example, you have your camera sitting over here and this is your kind of an idea of you, you're looking down, this is your image plane. And this is an object H, which, is, um, which you don't know about, which you have an inaccuracy in your, uh, in your terrain model, which assumes a flat terrain, but this is actually the height of that pixel location over here. And this is your height H, and this will lead to an error, capital R, and this is directly related to, the, um, to how far this point is actually away from your optical axis looking downwards. So the error depends on the height of the error. So if H gets larger, we would have another, we would have to choose another ray, which is go for the outside. So the larger the height difference is, the larger the error. It depends on the orientation of my camera, on the point in the image, because how far it is basically away from my, uh, from the, from the optical axis. And it also depends on the surface slope. So of course, if the surface would go down or the surface would change its direction so that this line is not parallel to this line anymore, if it would be slanted, for example, this would also have an effect. And we can actually quantify this effect quite easily by just um, using the interception theorem, or Strahlensatz in German, um, 
And you can actually see how the different quantities, how far you are away, how close you are, will impact the results. So increase distance from the principal point, so this is basically how far your, the, the pixel is away from the principal point or from the optical axis, um, will have an impact. And the smaller the camera, um, the camera constant, the larger this mistake gets. So if your camera constant gets smaller because you're basically having more wide angle camera, then your arrow will be larger. If you have a zoom camera and you're further away, the mistake will be smaller. And we can actually quantify the mistake that we have R um, is the R, it's the small r, so how far you are away from the principal point, divided by the camera constant times the height of the object that um, the, the mistake in the height. So there's a direct relationship between the height of the object and the mistake that you're doing, and it also depends where you are in an image and how high you're flying or your camera constant. So if you're the closer you're to the nadir view, the smaller the error is. So even if you're close, the smaller you're to the principal point, the better your result is. That means if you um, fly over a scene and you only take, and you have a high overlap between the images, and you can always take the nadir on a very small region around the, um, the principal point of the optical axis, then your mistakes will be smaller. If you exploit the full image, then your mistake will be larger. And you can directly see the mistake based on this equation over here. So the next thing that you need, may need to look into are the occlusions. So even if you have the right digital surface model, so you know the height of the objects, you take images, there can be occlusions that you cannot fix because you simply haven't pictured or haven't seen part of the world from your camera image that you need in order to build the autophoto. So this is an example, if you just build one autophoto and you were looking here kind of from that side and you perform the correction, so these buildings which are previously wrong are now in the right location, but you realize you actually haven't looked behind that building. So you are now you're proper, you know the proper height of that building, but you have taken only one image and that means there's basically the shadow of the image is the part that you haven't seen because the image, the top of the image was occluding your field of view and you couldn't look what's directly behind it on the ground. And this is something that you cannot fix easily for, or cannot fix at all from the information that you have from that single image. The only way to fix this is actually take more images so that you can look also from the other side and then take multiple images into account so that you can see from a second image the part which was occluded in the first image. And as a result of this, end up with what is so-called a true autophoto. So a true autophoto which has the performed the DSM uh, correction, so it took the correct height values into account and got rid of all the occlusions by taking multiple views and merging them so that you have what's called the true autophoto where you know that you have done all the corrections for the height differences and you have fused multiple images so that you actually have for every pixel value in your autophoto, you can actually copy an intensity value from your um, camera images. And this is what we then refer to the true autophoto. So what we have seen so far is the process of how to map images that we're taking from an aerial image where we know the exterior orientation and we know a digital surface model into an autophoto. And we have seen that um, if you have occlusions, because you have objects which stand out, which is the case at least in all city, in nearly all city environments and probably most other environments as well, um, you will have to have multiple images you need to combine you know, to make sure you see all the, the ground pixels which will be part of your autophoto in order to get, have a chance to copy an intensity value from the autophoto into your image. We've also seen that um, mistakes in the digital surface model, so if you get the wrong um, height estimates, um, this will lead to errors in your autophoto, basically that you copy the wrong intensity value and you're basically mapping errors in your height into planimetric errors, so a displacement in the image plane. And then basically means objects appear potentially larger than they are in reality, which is wrong. So you need to make sure you have a good 3D model, a good digital surface model. 
And what we also need to take into account, what we have seen that we need to do a right interpolation in order to interpolate the digital surface uh, model as well as the pixel locations in an image. And here we are typically using um, bicubic interpolation in order to get a good estimate of, um, the, of the mixture of, for example, pixel coordinates or intensity values that you need to take into account. Okay, so we said we need multiple images in order to compute those autophotos. So now consider I haven't taken multiple images, let's say 10 images of the same object, just to be sure I covered everything. How should I actually combine those different images? Which image to take when I perform my computation? And this is something that is called autophoto stitching. So I have multiple autophotos and I need to actually combine those autophotos um, or individual photos in order to get the right view. So even if I have kind of multiple views of the same scene, even if I can have multiple flight missions, maybe even flying in different days, and want to then combine the different information that I have, how should I actually do this? How can I perform this so-called autophoto stitching? And in order to perform this, we need to take multiple tasks into account. Basically, there are three main tasks. Well, the one thing I would like to do is a global lighting uh, normalization so that you don't see that maybe because the weather was different or um, you had different exposure at, um, time at, while taking the different images, you have changes in the brightness in your, in your images and you can see perfectly the cuts where those images have been taken. This is something I would like to avoid. Um, then we will look into kind of blending um, the intensity values from different um, images that have been taken. So if you have different, auto, different photos or different auto photos and you want to combine them, maybe it's good at the overlapping area to compute a weighted sum of the intensity values um, so that you actually get a smooth transition from one image into the other. And the third part I want to look into, which is scene carving, is basically how to break auto photos um, break them up into, in order to combine them into a nice proper way. So for example, you have different photos um, taken under different conditions. You can see it here, different lighting conditions, different areas, and you want to kind of combine them in a proper way so that you actually get, get up this image over here. So the question is, how should I actually break them up? So how do I actually compute these, this breakup and how to perform the different corrections such as lighting corrections and then also kind of interpolating between those individual images so that I get a nicely looking auto photo without these effects being actually visible. And we go to these three tasks, global lighting con uh, normalization, the blending, and in the end what's called seam carving in order to know how to cut your images, uh, your auto photo, into multiple sub-images. So the first, the lighting correction, um, basically says we make the assumption that on average the world is gray, and we change the individual channels of our image so that um, the average color taken over the images is actually gray. If you do the same thing for all images, we basically have the same average value which is involved in here. So what I'm doing, I'm taking my input image and I'm splitting this up in my RGB channels, so in my three different channels. And then I'm computing the mean of those intensity values. And this is R bar over here, or G bar, or B bar over here. And then I can compute uh, a, normalize, uh, a term which is basically the weighted sum of these different means. So a third of the red mean, a third of the green mean, and a third of the blue mean. And this is basically my normalization term in here. And what I then can do is I can enhance or reduce the impact of the red, green, or blue channel by saying this is this factor L divided by the mean. So how much more should I kind of increase the red channel with respect to the green and the blue channel in order to make sure that the world is kind of on average gray, that I normalize the average value over all images. So basically, for every pixel, I'm taking the intensity value, the red intensity value of the pixel, and multiplying it with this L, so um, how much the, the kind of the, um, the, the mean of the individual, um, individual means that I have, divided by the mean for this image. And this kind of increases or reduces the effect of the red, green, and blue channel and then multiply it with the individual values so that I get a corrected, a global lighting corrected output image so that on all images that I have, kind of the average color, so to say, average intensity value is gray. So I'd have the same normalization over all the images that all the outputs share the same normalization. Then the second thing I would like to do is kind of, I want to do a blending. So consider I have um, multiple images taken 
Um, and I want to want to overlay those images. So what we can uh, see over here is that this has been taken from, from different images and even though I have the global lighting conditions, I can see here, if you look carefully, a small cut. So this is a zoomed in view, you can see those things here, images are darker than those values over here. So the question is how can I actually fix this and kind of blend smoothly from one image into the other image so that here, of course, I have only the information from the left image. Here, I have only information from the right image. And here, in this overlapping area, I have actually a smooth transition from one into the other. And this, the result while this happens are changes in lighting or in exposure. And what I can do is I can kind of combine the left and the right image and give them a different weight. So weighing the left image um, more than the right image in certain areas and the right image more than the left image in certain areas. So consider we have, um, this, is, this is kind of my, um, the, the overall scene. So this is image number one. And this here is image number two. So this here is the overlapping area. We have information about the world from image number one and image number two. What I can do is I can make um, uh, a weight function which looks like this. So it is one over here in the area where I have no overlaps, where only I have information from this image. So its value is one. Then in the overlapping area, it actually linearly goes down until it reaches zero when I'm reaching the end of the image that I'm picturing and it's zero anywhere else. And for the other image, I do exactly the other, th other way around. It's zero over here until I start seeing something. The value increases from zero to one linearly until I reach the point where the other image doesn't provide any information. I'm going back to one. So if I sum up those two weight functions, the weight will always be one. It's just kind of a linear linear increase or decrease from one image into the other. So basically have a linear decrease of one image accompanied with a linear increase of the other image. So if I now take the image and multiply it with the weight factor, so this was image number one, image number two, and now I weighted that down. So you can see from this point the linear decrease in intensity value starts down to zero and here it starts on zero and increases up to one. And now I'm taking this color information and this color information, overlay them and basically add them up. So if I take those two into account, I add them up so that I again then have the image which where the weight is one everywhere and you can see that this cut actually goes away. This of course requires that the images are perfectly aligned with each other. Of course, if you would have a mismatch between those images, you would get a blurry images in the overlapping areas. Okay, so this was what's called the linear blending. I'm blending two images on top of each other based on this simple linear weighting function. The next question is how should I, if I have multiple of those images being taken, how should I actually cut one image or cut the images up and stack them together like a puzzle so that I actually minimize the effect that I have actually mismatches or uh, mismatches in color information. And that is kind of kind of interesting approach on how to find the optimal um, seam between two images. So let's say I have an overlapping regions between, uh, overlapping regions between two images. So this is um, an overlapping region and I have an image <coughs> I and an image J which has this overlapping region. So you can see these are the same objects but of course they will slightly differ in intensity values that I actually have. So what I can see, what I can do is I can overlap those images and then compute the error between those two images. So I'm basically overlaying those two images and I subtract the intensity value in image i minus the intensity value of image j. And maybe I compute here the, the Euclidean distance between the intensity values. So for every location in this image, I can compute this difference image. And this is shown over here, kind of a 3D view, the difference in intensity values between those images. What we can see here in this region, in the border region over here, I have high differences in intensity values. Also on the left border, there are some areas where I have high intensity values and then low intensity values actually in between. And what I can do is now is kind of say, okay, I want to find a cut from here to here, which tells me how one image should be cut and the other one should be puzzled together with the same cut. Um, so they are then combined. And I can do this by finding kind of the path through this kind of um, whatever valley of error values so to get a cut from here to here that minimizes the overall error. So the overall error um, kind of accumulated on that cut. 
And the interesting thing is, this is actually very similar to a path planning problem. And something you can use, for example, using um, a, a star algorithm, for example, in the easiest case. So you can start here and say, how should I actually reach from this area, this area over here, accumulating the smallest cost on the way? And this is something that you can directly do. You're basically planning a path which goes through the valleys from one side to the other. It's very similar if you have a mountain structure and let's say whenever you um, increase your altitude or whenever you're on a certain altitude, you get punished for this. So you want to go as low as possible through the valley. And this is exactly the same planning problem here. If you want to drive your vehicle being at low altitudes as best as possible and you want to avoid going up to high altitudes, this is the same way, the same planning problem that you solve here. So this results in finding the optimal seam or the optimal cut which takes, tells you which image to take, which pixels to take from image one, which pixels to take from image two, that you have a cut from top to bottom, which minimizes the error along that cut. And this is how you can, you find the optimal seams in order to stack auto or puzzle autophotos together. And what you then do is, you will still want to do your linear um, blending that we, that we discussed before. And the only problem is that it's no, not a straight line going through my images. I have basically some kind of, um, of, of cut that I have in here, which is not a straight line anymore. What you can, however, do is you can look into the distance trans what's called the distance transform blending. So you basically, for every pixel, estimate or compute how far is this pixel away from my cut. What well, is the shortest path from every pixel to my seam? And you're basically computing a weight that is proportional to the distance from the seam. The only difference is now it's not a clear cut and I can just count the number of pixels. I need to compute the shortest distance from every pixel to my seam. And this is something which I can do efficiently with the Euclidean distance transform, which tells you for every pixel the distance to another object. It was kind of the foreground background separation that we could do. So the Euclidean distance transform gives you a map for every pixel how far it is away to the seam from the foreground to the background. So for example, if I have the three autophotos that I actually want to stack together, I can actually have my seam cut over here and then can compute weights based on this Euclidean distance transform. So based on the cuts that you can actually see over here, which is taken here from different images. And then you need to make sure that your Euclidean um, distance transforms um, are normalized so that the sum of all of them adds up to one. And then you basically can compute weighted sums over a larger number, arbitrary number of images, making sure that all the blending is done in a smooth way. Even if your cut is not straight, you're basically doing your blending also in a non-straight fashion. And that's kind of the state of the art, how you do it. You compute your optimal seams and then look for every pixel how far it is away from the seam in order to compute the weight, how much this intensity value is taken into account when computing the combined or stitched autophoto together. So with this, um, uh, so what we have kind of seen so far is that given these aerial images and aerial and, and 3D data, we can compute autophotos. We need precise height information and can combine multiple um, photos in, uh, to avoid occlusions and compute the true autophoto. And we can actually combine multiple images, multiple autophotos, but then this requires this autophoto stitching in order to build um, a whole landscape of, uh, of uh, cover the whole uh, country with autophotos. You need to stitch those autophotos into, uh, together in order to get the right kind of puzzle together, which is done with the stitching technique I have presented over here. So this was kind of the general introduction into those order photos. What I want to do in the last couple of minutes, I want to look into a special case of order photos when you know that the surface you're picturing is actually a plane, a planar surface. So how can you simplify your computations by knowing that the object you're picturing is actually a surface? And this is important for autophotos, often used in autophotos, if you want to do measurements which are not necessarily taken from aerial images. Let's say you're picturing facades of a building and you want to perform measurements how far windows are away for, for, uh, from each other, for example. And you, want to, you just have one photo of that facade and how can you actually do this correction of the image so that you can actually perform those measurements by exploiting the fact that you know the facade is a perfect plane. Of course, if you have objects from your facade standing out or sticking out, 
you again will make errors, will make mistakes. But assuming it's a planar surface, how can we actually optimize this process or simplify that process so that we do not need to have the full 3D information of that facade? So we don't need to bring a laser scanner or take multiple images to do a 3D reconstruction of the facade. Just one single image is sufficient if we know that the objects we are picturing is actually a plane. And therefore, this is of high um, relevance for practical applications. So if you know that you're picturing a planar surface and you have an, uh, a picture, just one single photo of that planar surface, you can actually convert your images in your image into an orthophoto that you can measure on that plane, even if you don't have the 3D information about the object at hand. If you don't have any metric information, you can only do it up to a scale, but you at least can compare distances with each other. Okay, how can we do this? In order to do this, we first need to understand the, the mapping process that we have. So consider that we have kind of our plane where we compute the, the, the autophoto on the autophoto plane, so to say, is shown down here. And this is a plane of the object that you're picturing. So we know that it is a plane, um, but we do not know necessarily how it is oriented in space. But we know that from our autophoto image plane to the plane, we have an affine transformation. So six degree of freedom to map this plane to this plane under an affine transformation, kind of. This is this red transformation over here. And we also know that there's a mapping <coughs> from the, uh, the plane into my image, which is a projective transformation in here. Again, mapping this plane into this plane. And again, we don't have arbitrary 3D objects in here. We just have planes in here, and this makes it easier for us. So this projectivity um, is, has eight parameters, because we, are, we can kind of reduce this now from 3D into a 2D projective space. In a 2D projective space, we have uh, the transformation matrix would be a 9 by, uh, 3 by 3 matrix with 9 elements. But given that it's only defined up to a scale factor, this would end up in 8 degrees of freedom. So we have a 6 degree of freedom, a fine transformation, and an 8 degrees of freedom projectivity. If we multiply them with each other, then it would lead to a projectivity with 8 degrees of freedom. So a 3 by 3 matrix which tells us how the mapping from the image plane to the object exactly looks like. So with just this single transformation, I can directly map from the image into the orthophoto plane. I don't need to have the digital surface model where I need to make this look up. So this makes it much, much easier. So I have a mapping of um, a matrix H, which maps a point, which maps points between the image plane, so the actual image plane and the auto image plane into each other. And this has only eight degrees of freedom because it's nine values minus one for the normalization. So how can this be done? So I'm setting my coordinate system up in a way that the uh, orthophoto plane is the xy plane and z basically sticking up in here. And let's assume this is where your camera image has been taken from. So I have this direct mapping of every point from the orthophoto plane into my image. And this can be done by this transformation over here. So given that I know the object is a plane, I know the z coordinate will be zero. So every point lies in the xy plane. Right? So every point lies in the xy plane is mapped to an xy point in my camera image through the, this projectivity. And um, this is actually something that is very similar to the checkerboard pattern, if you remember that correctly, that we used in Tsang's method to calibrate a camera. There we also set the coordinate system into the checkerboard pattern so that all the intersections of the black and white patterns lie in the xy plane and can be directly mapped into an image or in, into, into my camera image. And we basically use the same or something extremely similar, actually the same thing over here. We set our autophoto plane into uh, the coordinate system into our autophoto plane and then map our camera, uh, a point, into my camera image. But I don't know where the camera image actually has been taken. Also something I did not know in Sung's method. But just by um, having a few corresponding points, we can actually perform this. And the important thing in here that this matrix H is a projectivity mapping from P2 into P2. So it's a projectivity in SUS invertible. There's no projection from the 3D world into the 2D world as I would have it if I would perform my mapping in the general 3D world. By constraining that everything lies within that plane is a mapping just between two planes. And this is kind of the key inside why this mapping actually is invertible and can directly be applied. 
So it basically means we have eight unknown parameters of my uh, projective transformation H. Um, if we have corresponding points from my camera image and a point on the image plane, that basically means I need to know a point where that point lies or that the point lies in the plane that I'm considering. That gives me two linearly independent equations. That means if I have eight unknowns, every point gives me two observations. I need four or more points um, for which none, three of them should lie on a line as a constraint to give me eight or more equations. So four corresponding points will give me eight equations. The, only, the points should not lie on a line, all three points. Of course, two will always lie on a line, but um, pairs should not lie on a line. And then I can actually compute a solution on how this matrix H should look like based on these observations. So by knowing, by knowing points in my 2D image and knowing that those points lie on the, um, that these are planar points on our surface. And there's a solution that we can compute with a singular value decomposition. And it's important to know that I don't need to know the interior or the exterior orientation of my camera. I just need to know that those points must uh, that the points that I'm clicking in my image lie on the plane. So, how does it look like? I have four more points for which I know I have the point which is over here and I know that this is a point in my, in my image. And um, what I then can do is I can get my, I get these equations for all the, of all pairs of points where these are my knowns and I'm sitting in here, I have sitting my unknown parameters. And they're basically collecting multiple of those points. And then the solution to solve this error minimization problem that I have is actually identical to Tsang's method, or very similar to DLT and identical to what we use in Tsang's method for cam camera calibration in photogrammetry one course. So we are able to, with a singular value decomposition, to compute this transformation by knowing those parameters and where those points actually have been mapped into my image. So what I need to do, just as a brief reminder, this is just a solution, not going to deal, details how that works. We need to vectorize my matrix H to give me my, my unknown parameters. Then I build um, a system M in order to estimate my parameters. And this is a matrix M, so that M times my unknown parameters must be zero. This is the constraint that I have. And I build M up in a certain way that the coefficients of the individual um, rows of this matrix look like this. So they contain the parameters of the points in the 3D world and the points in my camera image so that I then can perform this, um, this error minimization. And this is done by applying the singular value decomposition and looking into the matrix V. And then the last column of V is the singular value which corresponds to the uh, singular vector which corresponds to the smallest singular value. And this is the solution to my least squares approach. So that the, the last column of V gives you the individual nine values that you need in order to compute H. And so you can do this as an example from, uh, from ETH, from um, Konrad Schindler, where you have your image, you have the coordinates of these points over here on that facade. So you can actually turn this into an orthophoto of that facade. Of course, remember, it just holds, assumes that all the points lie on this image plane. So all the points which don't lie on this image plane, like here in, at the entry, or those elements over here, or the roof sticking out, will not be correct. But you can, for example, now measure whatever, the size or the distance of the windows on that facade information. So to sum up, um, we have talked about autophotos here, and, and they are an important element for aligning aerial images with maps, for example, or to generate um, images in which you can directly measure the x, y distances um, so that you have an, an, an image in which you can actually measure in. And that's very handy for a lot of applications, especially if you want to combine um, metric information with image information. What's a prerequisite for that? So what you need is you need to have these aerial images or images picturing a scene. So don't necessarily need to be aerial, of course, can also be taken manually. Um, you need to know the orientation parameters. So where has this image been taken and um, 
and what are the intrinsics of my camera, and you know, need to have 3D information about the surface you're picturing, so a digital surface model. And if you have that, you can directly compute your autophoto, and there's also the special case of the planar object that you need to have then four corresponding points in image and on the plane so that you can perform the computations over here. Um, and with this, you can actually compute your autophoto and then have a corrected image in which you can actually measure in. So that's it from my side. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope that was useful. Thank you.